I think we can get started. We need more time to visit, Marge. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, we'll begin this morning with verses 13 and 14. We're using the English Standard Translation, and the text reads, Better was a poor and wise youth than an old and foolish king who no longer knew how to take advice. For he went from prison to the throne, though in his own kingdom he had been born poor. And I admit to you that uh, commentators are not in agreement as to precisely what Solomon has in mind here. But if you read the full context of chapter 4, it's quite possible that we have two kings, and one is willing to take advice, the other is not. And the one who takes advice will be able to prosper. The one who refuses advice will incur difficulty as a result. And when I think of that, I can't help but think of what followed Solomon's reign. Rehoboam, his son, came to the throne over 12 tribes, but by his death, he ruled only two. And the explanation that is offered is very simple. Uh, there is a question about taxation. Do we make the burden of the people heavier or lighter? He consulted his father's aged advisors, and they all recommended that the tax burden be lightened and the people would in turn support him. He turned to his young friends and sought their direction and they in turn said, make it as hard as you can. And of course I'm paraphrasing. And Rehoboam listened to his young counselors rather than his father's wise advisors. And that led to the division of the kingdom. Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, would rule the northern kingdom of Israel, and Rehoboam was left with Judah and Benjamin. It wasn't a very wise choice, and it had serious consequences, but that's always the case. We need to make decisions in life. That's unavoidable. But the difficult decisions should be made after careful consideration a lot of time in prayer, a lot of time in consultation, uh, get as much information as you can, and then make your choice. And it doesn't seem that that's always what happens, and Solomon is illustrating this in chapter 4, which leads to the question from these two verses, how is a poor and wise child better than an old and foolish king? It's pretty hard for ordinary folk to look at the difference between someone who is born into this world in poverty and lives in poverty and contrast that with a king, but there are times when being born in poverty is preferable to being a king and having to deal with all that uh, sometimes comes uh, with the throne, including threats to one's life. If you go through scripture carefully and really pay close attention to monarchs and their fates, you may be, or then you may not be, surprised to learn that many of them did not die natural deaths. And that's not just true in terms of the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. That's true in regard to Babylon, Assyria, the Persians, the Greeks and the division of Alexander's kingdom, there's constant strife and there's always someone wanting that position and willing to do whatever it takes to get it. So I'm not so sure that if you operate under the premise that it would have been nice to have been born into royalty that you've thought it through as carefully as you should. Here's the response that we'll give to the question we've raised. And what we're doing in this format is looking at the verses and then raising a question and, and then providing an answer. I want you to think about it, but because of the setting, 
I'm a mile away from you, it's pretty hard to engage in conversation or discussion. A child can be admonished, that is, receive instruction, but not a king. And these, of course, general uh, concepts, but I think they hold fairly true. Verse 14 is thought to describe a poor and wise lad of verse 13 to be a young man who had come out of prison and then had risen to the position of king, even though he had been born poor. And this illustrates how far one can advance in life when he's willing to receive instruction. And that's really at the core of verses 13 and 14. Wise people are willing to listen to others. Now, to listen doesn't compel one uh, to take advice, but it certainly does indicate a willingness to do so. And when that advice is perceived to be good, then a readiness to act upon it. On the other hand, you have people that have all the answers and they don't even know the questions, who can't be advised, who refuse to listen to anyone, and that's really a formula for disaster. And it seems to me that this is what Solomon was conveying in chapter 4, and remember, he's writing from the perspective of one at this point who does not take into consideration that there is a spiritual dimension to life. Life under the sun is life that is almost exclusively materially and physically oriented. And there's an entirely different perception to life when you factor in God and realize that there's something beyond this realm. But if you look at it, as we've already learned from the perspective of what occurs under the sun, it looks like whether you're a man or an animal, you meet the same fate, you die, and your body decays, and we don't know whether the spirit of man goes up and the spirit of the animal goes down. We are clueless if we look at this solely from the material or human perspective. Now, ultimately, because you're all Bible students, you know that Solomon, and I think he's writing near the close of his life, concludes that you don't live life simply with a physical and material uh, vantage. You have to take in the spiritual and the eternal and realize that life really, if it's lived well, is lived uh, to the extent possible in obedience to the will of God and that the duty of man first and foremost above everything else is to honor, revere, or the King James says, fear God. And he says the reason is very simple. We're going to have to face him in judgment someday. And we will give account of everything that we have done in our bodies, whether they be good or evil. We understand that because we're coming from a spiritual perspective. Sadly, out here in the world today, most folks don't share that spiritual perspective. And so they bring to life every day a different attitude than we have. And it can be really frustrating for us as Christians to see the things that generally everyone held near and dear just a few decades ago abandoned by the masses. And they seem unwilling to hear anyone who would advise against this attitude of living life solely from a material and physical orientation. But that's what Solomon is observing, and most of the conclusions that he draws are drawn from this under-the-sun observation. That's true out here in the world with our friends and neighbors now. I think 50, 60 years ago, most people would have shared the convictions that we have regarding right and wrong, good and evil, and wouldn't find the things that we typically say and do and believe to be all that out of the ordinary. But now it's a different story. We believe in the sanctity of life. We believe in God's laws on human sexuality. We believe that it's important to tell the truth, to buy the truth and sell it not, to borrow from Proverbs 23, 23. We believe that we ought to treat people the way we would want them to treat us. We think that there are greater advantages to being generous 
than to being the recipient of generosity, that it's more blessed to give than to receive, these are not things, and they're just illustrations of the mindset that Christians have in opposition to the world. And Solomon is dealing with that in Ecclesiastes. I saw all the living who move about under the sun, along with that youth who was to stand in the king's place. There was no end of all the people, all of whom he led, yet those who came later, who come later, will not rejoice in him. Surely this also is vanity and is striving after the wind. And again, the contrast seems to be between two men. They both come to the throne. They come from different backgrounds. One is successful and seems to be at least for a time revered. The other is not. And the reason that is offered is essentially one is willing to live and learn, to listen, and to grow, and the other is not. Positions of authority or power can be easily abused if we're not careful. When we think that we're above reproach, that we're beyond advice, that we have all the answers, uh, that leads to serious consequences. Uh, it's true in regard to the ruling of a nation, and that's what we're dealing with here. But the principles apply to just about anything in life, do they not? If you have a home and a marriage where one believes that he or she knows everything and refuses to ever consider the welfare or receive input from one's mate or even from one's children on occasion, that's a formula for disaster. The same would be true in any business undertaking or even in the church. Uh, we have to be willing to listen and learn. It doesn't necessarily mean we'll always agree or we'll always take advice, but at least the contrast here is between one who will and one who won't, and the consequences are obviously different for the one who will than for the one who won't. So explain the reference to this second child here in verses 15 and 16. So we'll try to do that now. And uh, again... It's not an easy text, and I acknowledge that at the outset, but the second boy could be another lad who, like the first, had risen to a position of prominence while the first lad had fallen out of favor with the people, perhaps uh, for the same reason the people had grown to dislike the first king. Or it's also possible, and in my judgment more likely, it could be the same lad that's uh, mentioned in the previous verses who replaced the old and foolish king. There's an old king and then a young man comes on the scene with an entirely different background. And again, I can't help but think of Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Rehoboam is the son of Solomon. He comes from royal blood and he's had all the advantages. Jeroboam was not. And yet in terms of sheer power, and influence, Jeroboam influences ten tribes, Rehoboam influences two. Now, Jeroboam influences those ten tribes in a really bad way. For the remainder of Israel's history, the kings that follow will be said to have sinned after the similitude of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who did cause Israel to sin. But it's not out of the realm of reality to see one man come to the throne, as is often the case, because he is in the royal lineage. Solomon actually came to the throne, our author, uh, not because he was the eldest son, but the son that David designated to be successor. Adonijah, therefore, which was the eldest and considered himself the rightful heir, ultimately was pushed out of the way and eventually uh, put to death because he still sought to usurp at Solomon's authority. Not every king comes from such a background. And this is what Solomon is acknowledging here. The very people who had liked and supported the lad who became king eventually would be uh, unhappy with him. And it seems what we have really depicted as this chapter draws to a close is the fickleness in people everywhere. And people can be very fickle. It leads to the conclusion one more time that this 
too is vain. And when, when I talk about fickleness, uh, it has been my experience that people do not remember the good things that you do for them. But they will never forget the one thing they didn't think was right or the one thing they wanted done that you didn't do. You can contrast a hundred good things with one that they consider bad and they'll only remember the bad. Because people, sadly, are fickle 3,000 years ago. <laughs> and people, as much as technology has changed and altered our lives, we're just the same people we've always been. And we wrestle with the same issues. And the point that Solomon has made through the first four chapters is, and we never learn. Generation follows generation. We face the same problems. We respond to them in the same way. It doesn't work, but we just keep doing the same thing. I think of this in terms of government. What is the answer to every problem from a governmental perspective? I know you can't respond, but the answer is more money. Let's just pour more money into it. That'll take care of it. More money into COVID. How many trillions of dollars have we spent over the last two and a half years? And I'm not trying to be political here, but what has it accomplished? Education, we have poured billions and billions and billions of dollars into education. We still are having kids drop out and fail year after year after year. And the educational system right now, I'm not speaking specifically of Marietta, but in general, especially in much larger districts, including where my own grandchildren are, often seems to be more interested in pushing a political and an immoral, woke agenda than just teaching, reading, writing, and arithmetic. We just need to spend more money, though. And what about poverty? Remember Lyndon Baines Johnson and the war on poverty? How much has been invested and what has been accomplished? Do you know that you cannot help anyone out of poverty who will not help themselves? It's just not possible. And will that war ever be won? Not if you believe the scriptures. Remember the woman who made the costly sacrifice of anointing the feet of Jesus with precious ointment? And Judas' response was, we could have sold that. It's worth more than 300 denarii. That's 300 days wages, and we could have given that to the poor. And Jesus said, you'll always have the poor with you. So I take him at his word. You can't spend your way out of poverty. Money is not going to solve problems. But that's what we keep doing. And Solomon is saying, this is our problem. Generation follows generation. We face the same problems. We offer the same solutions. They didn't work the first time. Why do we think they're going to work the second, third, hundredth time? They don't. Maybe we just should look to God's word for the answers and stick with them and we'll be in a much better position. So that's what I think chapter 4 is saying and I admit to you that it's difficult and if you look at it and you come away with a different interpretation, I'm not going to argue with you about it. I'm just trying to give you a basis from what I'm able to glean from the text to kind of put things in perspective. Let's stop looking at life solely from a material and physical perspective under the sun. And remember, there is a God to whom all of us are accountable. He has revealed himself. And life is never going to go well for any of us as long as we ignore him. Whether we're a king or the poorest of men, we still need to submit to the will of God. Chapter 5. Chapter 5 addresses the issue of worship. And I don't know the mind of our 
author what takes him from one particular concept to another, and I don't need to know. I believe he is inspired, that God is directing his pen, and that even when I don't quite get the direction he may go, I know that it's the right direction and God is guiding him, and I just need to sit up and pay attention. And so we, we now go from this situation about the, the rulers and the fickleness of men to, to focus on worship. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Now, from a biblical perspective, the house of God we probably would think of first as the tabernacle, which was built during that 40 years in the wilderness and served as the, the seat and center of religious life for uh, the folks who left Egypt and started for Canaan. God gave Moses specific instruction, and we will learn in our Hebrew study on Wednesday nights, and he said, you follow the pattern. And there are people who will tell you there are no patterns in Scripture. They're the people who don't read Scripture. There was a pattern for the tabernacle. When Solomon writes this, the house of God is the temple, which... David had conceived and Solomon had carried out the conception by actually seeing it built. And uh, today, the house of God isn't a physical structure. It is the church, which is called in, I think it's 1 Timothy 3.15, the house or household of faith. Uh, we have people every once in a while that come by and they want to come into the sanctuary and pray. And we're always happy to open our building and, and let people do that. But I have to tell you, your prayer is just as good and powerful sitting out on the steps in front of the building or sitting in your car on Washington or 6th Street as it would be sitting in here in a pew. This is not holy ground. This is not a holy place. We are a holy people. And God says, be holy as I am holy. But there was a time when there was a tabernacle and then a temple, they were referred to as the house of God, the place of worship, and they were holy. In fact, both contained a holy place and a most holy place. And people went there to worship and to sacrifice, which was one way of worshiping. So he says, guard your steps when you go to the house of God. And in essence, what he's saying is worship serious stuff. It's important business be prepared. Watch what you're doing and what you're thinking. Prepare yourself. To draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools. For they do not know that they are doing evil. I want you to think about that. To draw near to listen is better than to offer sacrifice of fools. Fools don't know what they're doing and don't realize they're doing evil. Now, how do I relate that to our setting? And our worship will start in uh, approximately, what, 33, 34 minutes? If we're on time, 35. Are you prepared for worship? Did you get a good night's rest? Have you thought about the text that will be the basis of our study? Have you contemplated your giving because we're to give not just as we've prospered but as we've purposed in our hearts? Will you be focused on the prayer and will those words be repeated in your heart and express the true sentiments of the corporate body in worship? Will you sing or will you just sit and listen like, I don't want to put a percentage on it, but sadly... Many people don't sing loud enough to be heard. You say, but I don't sing well. The Bible doesn't say sing well. It says sing. Do you participate? Or do you just come and sit and look for things to criticize? And they're always going to be there. I don't think I can speak for 30 minutes and not slur two or three words and mispronounce one or two others and forget at least one passage and think that I'm citing one and actually quoting another. And I admit it, I don't like it, and I wish I could do better, and I do prepare, but I'm flawed. 
and my West Virginian just kind of sneaks out every once on, in a while on me, and I'll talk about chimneys and all kinds of things that I grew up believing were right, only to find out that they're chimneys, not chimneys. And that's just one example. That stuff will just come out. Forgive me. I'm trying. Don't focus on that. Ask, is what I'm hearing what God's word says, and how do I make that a part of my life? When the song leader leads the song, don't be so much focused on whether or not it's perfect timing and perfect pitch, and we get every note, but... Express the sentiments of your heart through the words of the song and know that you're teaching the people around you, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. You see, worship is important. And it will be extremely helpful when we're ready. If we just kind of show up and walk in at the last minute and get out of here sometimes even before the last amen, and we've made no preparation, and we've only brought a critical eye, I'm not sure we're guarding our steps, are you? And Solomon says, folks, when you go to the house of worship, the house of God, guard your steps. So what advice is given to those who go to the house of God? How would you answer that question? When the man enters the house of God, place of worship, he guards his steps, he watches his thoughts and his actions. He is coming to listen and learn, not to speak. Doesn't that seem to be the basis of verse 1? The fool talks and talks and talks. The wise man realizes that we should be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. James 1, 19. Now, is there time to talk? Obviously. But don't you believe in your heart of hearts that God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason? Can I say to you that we probably should, at, at the very least, talk only half as much as we listen? The sacrifice of fools could refer to the sacrifices that did not meet God's requirements. They had to be perfect, as you know, and meet certain standards. You couldn't just bring anything to the altar and expect God to accept it. If you have any doubts about that, read Malachi 1, Leviticus 5, and others. It could include the vows that you've made and whether or not you keep them. And I say that because I've read ahead. I know what the next few verses are going to talk about. I think when you consider verse 1, it might be very helpful to reread 1 Corinthians 11. In 1 Corinthians 11, one of the things that Paul does is emphasize the proper attitude toward the Lord's Supper. If we eat and drink without discerning the Lord's death, his body and his blood, our worship is unacceptable, inappropriate. We're eating and drinking unworthily, in an unworthy manner, and I need to stop and say the Bible doesn't say that you have to be worthy. That's not what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11. He's not talking about whether or not we're worthy of participating at the Lord's table. He's talking about the attitude that we bring to it. Do we see the, the wafer as emblematic of the body of Christ, or do we say it tastes like cardboard? Why are we using this garbage? What matters how it tastes? It is unleavened bread, and it's not how it tastes, it's not its texture, it's what it symbolizes that matters. And we do it every Lord's Day because we're forgetful people. It is a monument to the Master's death, his burial, his resurrection, and his promised return because in 1 Corinthians 11, we're to eat and drink until he come. Some translations say come again, until he comes again. But we bring the right attitude. Fools, on the other hand, 
do not come to the house of God to worship with the right attitude. Let's learn and not follow the example of fools. Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God, for God is in heaven and you're on earth, therefore let your words be few. Now he's dealing with worship in terms of vows, not something that we do collectively. It's something that I find to be acceptable on a personal level if you so choose. You can promise God, which is what a vow really is, such and such. I believe you can even connect your promise with some request to God. Remember Hannah? God, if you'll give me a son, I vow, I promise to give him back to you when he's weaned. Everyone knows the story of Samuel if they know much about Scripture. What is really significant is not just Hannah's promise, but the fulfillment of it. If you make a promise to God, make sure that you honor that promise. And it's best not to make a lot of promises. Fools talk and talk and talk. Wise men are more cautious. Remember, this is all in the context of worship here in chapter 5. So what warning about the tongue is given? Don't be quick or hasty to speak. And I think that's true not just in a worship context, folks. Don't you believe that that's really true in relationship to all of life? Here in context, God w wants worshipers to give forethought to their worship, knowing ahead of time what they want to do and say. So he's saying, remember your place, God is in heaven, you're mere mortals on earth, therefore let your words be few, and again, we hearken back to James 1.19. We have come not so much to speak, but to listen to God. And we don't come to hear the preacher, we come to hear the gospel. I've told you for 37 years, don't invite people to come here to hear me or someone else. Invite them to come hear about Jesus, to hear the gospel proclaimed. And I would emphasize the hearing. Over the last, I'd say, probably 40 years, there's been an emphasis in pulpits, I, I think certainly in the denominational realm, but even in the church, We've gone from really emphasizing the importance of listening to just talking all the time about loving. Oh, we just got to love each other. We've got to love God. We've got to love Christ. I don't dispute any of that at all, but can you do that if you don't first listen? How do you know the proper way to express love toward God, Christ, the church, the scriptures? unless you listen. And I think the way I illustrate this from my own personal perspective, because I'm old enough to look back now, I remember 40 years ago, all of the debate about which translation should we read. I was teaching a ladies class in another congregation, and we were studying Old Testament, and they were saying, we're finding it really difficult. I suggested that they read the New International Version in conjunction with the King James, the New King James, the New American Standard Bible, all reputable translations. The NIV, in many ways, is not. But there are times when it can be terribly helpful in dealing with difficult verses, and I would always recommend that people use several translations, not just rely on one. I ordered inexpensive NIVs and gave them to my class. Within probably a week, I was branded a false teacher by a local preacher because I had endorsed the NIV. Didn't call and ask if it were the case. Just heard that I'd given them NIVs and immediately false teacher, embracing a liberal translation. None of it was true. I 
cautioned them repeatedly about how careful they needed to be with the NIV. If you're using the NIV, I think for basic history, it's fine. Uh, understanding the Old Testament is helpful, uh, but it's not always doctrinally reliable. So you don't want to use it certainly exclusively. But at that point, everybody was focused on got to, you got to use the right translation and. For some, it was the King James. If it was good enough for Paul, it should be good enough for all of us. And I think you can probably see through the foolishness of such an argument, but it was being made. And in some places, still being made, not just by our brethren, but there are denominations that share that same conviction. The truth of the matter is, there is no single translation that we can honestly argue is superior and should be used by everyone. But we were so busy focused on which translation folks were reading that we forgot to emphasize you need to be reading. And so folks weren't reading and they weren't listening and therefore they weren't growing. I don't want to make those kinds of mistakes. Solomon seems to be giving us advice to avoid doing those kinds of things. For a dream comes with much business and a fool's voice with many words. A dream and a fool's voice, many words. Solomon, where are you headed here? That's my first question as I read verse 3. Uh, but how's a fool known? And, and his response is that a fool's known by his continual talking. So he's drawing a parallel between what hinders one from restful sleep, the dream, and uh, what keeps one awake at night, a mind preoccupied with the affairs of the day. The same thing is true in terms of worship. What hinders us from effective and acceptable worship? Too much talking not enough listening, using many words. What makes a fool foolish is desire to talk and his failure to listen. And this setting, chapter 5, is a worship setting, but it is really true relative to all life. Listen. Pay attention to what you hear. You'll find, if you just go back and read the four Gospels, you'll find Jesus on more than one occasion saying, pay attention. Be careful what you hear. John, surely your clock is fast. We're supposed to get through a chapter a week, but some chapters only have a few verses, so don't get too concerned yet. When you vow a vow to God, do not delay paying it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Fools make promises and don't honor them. The equivalent of vows. Pay what you vow. It's better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. That's pretty clear cut. If you promise God something, make a vow to God, make sure you honor that vow. And it's probably best not to make vows if you're not going to be conscientious because you can't say God I'm sorry I forgot it doesn't work that way God doesn't forget and he demands that we honor our promises and I would tell you that the principle that is in play here relative to worship and vows or promises to God is a principle that, in my judgment, relates to all of life. Uh, raising our children, I made many promises to them, but I never made one that wasn't conditioned on the fact that I'm not in charge. It was always if God wills. And the reality is that often God didn't agree. Uh, they asked me one time if we'd ever take a vacation when I didn't have to come back for a funeral. I don't know. It's up to God. 
When can we go somewhere? We can go on this day if God wills. And then somebody dies. Or something else happens. Or somebody gets sick. Or there are all kinds of contingencies. Make promises and be absolutely determined to honor them, but understand that you're not in charge. And when you make a promise to God, to the absolute best of your ability, carry it out, fulfill it. But what instructions are given here regarding vows? Honor them. A vow was a kind of agreement proposed to God in which the worshiper commits to do something from a one-time sacrifice to a long-term action if God would grant his appeal or her appeal. One might think, as I've already said of Hannah, Hannah prayed, moving her lips, but no sound was audible. I remember being told that silent prayer was unscriptural. Somebody doesn't read their Bible. Hannah's prayer was inaudible, but God heard and answered it. She made a promise, I'll give you my son if you'll give me a son. And she honored her promise. Thus, when we make a vow, be sure to keep it. Far better not to make a vow than to make it and fail to keep it. And I think it's fair to ask, and we'll stop there, uh, pick it up next week with verses 6 and 7, God willing. Can we make vows today? Is that acceptable from a Christian perspective? And if not, why not? And if we do make a promise to God, a vow... We had better follow through. God, if you bless me materially, I'll give you 20% of everything you send my way. And God opens the windows of heaven and pours it out. You better make sure you honor your promise. And I'm not preaching a health and wealth gospel here. I don't believe in the prosperity gospel, but I do believe that God blesses his people but expects those blessings to be used. So if you seek the blessing, better follow through with the promise. That's the point that Solomon is making here, and it's all in the context of recognizing the importance and seriousness of your relationship with your Creator and your role in worship. Come prepared to worship and focus on the right thing, have the right attitude, and God will bless you. Without the right attitude, you will not derive blessings here or hereafter. We've got to quit because John's going to have his finger on the buzzer again in just seconds, so there's no point in starting uh, verses 6 and 7, but they're following the same theme, which is how important it is. Listen more and talk less.